Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to the RIBA Future Architects Part 3 Meetup. My name is Natalie Baxter. I'm a qualified architect with over 10 years experience and practice, both in the UK and Asia, and I'm delighted to be hosting tonight's event. Firstly, thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. I hope you're all well and safe wherever you are in the world. After all, RIBA is a global professional membership body, and tonight we can all feel truly part of this international community of architects. Welcome, in particular, those of you who have just started your part three course. I graduated part three five years ago at Newcastle University whilst working at Fault the Browns Architects. And since then, I've mentored others through their part three studies alongside working in practice and completing a part time master's degree in interdisciplinary design and management for the built environment at Cambridge University. I'm now pursuing teaching and research. We hope this event will touch on some of the challenges of part three and also provide advice and inspiration for you all. I'd like to mention that a great source of support is RIBA membership. If you have completed an RIBA recognised part one and two course, then you are eligible for associate membership. It starts at £87 and as part of your membership, you'll have access to the RIBA Future Architects programme, which provides a range of events, activities, resources and opportunities for members as you progress during your part three and on to qualification. I encourage you all to visit the Future Architects Hub page on architecture.com and find out a little bit more about membership. So on to some housekeeping. We are recording tonight's event, so those that can't join us live will be able to watch afterwards. We will upload it to the RIBA Future Architects YouTube playlist for everyone to access. We invite you to use the Q&A function to say hello and send in questions and comments during the event. Do tell us your name and where you're working and who your question's for. We hope the technology will work for us tonight, but if we have any problems, we will do our best to continue. And if that becomes impossible, we'll contact you all to reschedule. We aim to finish at seven o'clock, so let's begin. Tonight, we have a panel of guest speakers lined up for you, each speaking for five minutes. The aim of this event is to share an insight into part three studies for those starting their part three now. We hope to provide you all with useful information, insight, reassurances, and hopefully some inspiration. We will select and pose questions to the panel once everyone has presented. So please do include who the question is for and try to be concise. Our first speaker is, is Gabby Zakharovskita, who has recently completed the RIBA Advanced Diploma in Professional Practice in Architecture, or Part 3 course, and works at MAP Architecture as a project lead. We welcome Gabby. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm Gabby. Uh, I'm a recent graduate. I only got my results uh, a couple of weeks ago, so it's all um, still really fresh. Um, I come from an international background, so I'm originally from Lithuania and I did my master studies in Sweden uh, for sustainable development. And currently I work in a small, um, very young practice called um, MAP Architecture. Um, so as a fresh graduate, I thought I can just share probably my best tips um, that I gained over the last nine months. And so I'll try and be really quick um, and just give kind of practical tips to you. Um, so for me, what worked best, the number one thing was to really plan your time. Um, so for part three course, there's so many moving parts, uh, the case study and the CV and appraisal PDR. So what I did, I had almost like a visual calendar for each phase um, where I kind of allocated time that I was going to spend um, on each part. Um, another thing um, that was a huge help um, as a part three um, student was actually joining the study group. Um, so I've been kind of told how important that was, but once I joined the group, it was just amazing to um, share the knowledge between us. Um, so as I work in a small practice, we actually had someone on the team who works for Fosters. So having that kind of cross uh, exchange of different experiences, that was really, really good. Um, another thing um, I would suggest to whoever's, you know, entering the part three now uh, is to look at previous submissions. So I asked my colleagues at work and they were really happy to share um, their submissions that they had in the last, you know, five years. So that was really, really useful as well, just to get um, your head around, you know, what's going on. Um, also, uh, make the most of your 
PSA, um, PSA time comes at a premium. So if you do get an hour tutorial, that would be, you know, um, the best opportunity to get an input from PSA. So um, just even if it's, you know, a draft, I've, I found that maybe um, I didn't want to share something that's not ready, but just go for it. Um, same as PSA, um, use your office mentor and your colleagues. Don't be afraid to ask. I find that in COVID um, environment, it was kind of difficult to get that contact with your office team, but really don't be afraid to uh, seek for help uh, and they will remember what it's like to be a part three and um, everyone was really, really kind to helping me. Um, and then lectures and seminars uh, from your course. That was really, really good too. Um, there were a couple of things I've written down actually, things that I would do differently if I had a chance uh, to do part three again. Um, one of those things would be start with your PDRs early, <laughs> as in as soon as possible. Probably this weekend start looking at it but because uh, for me, um, I aim to finish my PDRs kind of a couple months before submission, but if you can, you know, bash them out now, just go for it and do it as soon as possible because um, you want to save that precious time at the end for case study and the practice problems and those kind of things. Um, and also the group, um, I actually lost my study group when I started the course because of COVID, everything was moving around. It was hard to kind of contact people. Um, so if you don't have a study group, make sure that you either make a new one or join existing, talk to your course leader and they will definitely be able to help you. Um, for maybe more um, exam tips, um, I'm not going to lie, the exam, the two days examination, um, that was the one that I took from Reba North. Um, the two days are intense. That's probably um, the most kind of challenging part. But if you're prepared, it's absolutely fine. Um, for me, I had a couple things uh, prepared for the exam. I had some useful printouts. Um, I had um, Reba ARB guides and um, the codes for uh, professional conduct. I had um, this super, super useful book, which is um, Architects Legal Pocket Book with lots of kind of little tabs. And um, so these were the things that really helped me to, you know, get focus, get um, in that short amount of time, as well as having um, all the kind of recent contracts and things like that. Um, but just to wrap it up, my top tip as a fresh part three graduate would be um, try and um, rest. And that's not just kind of before the exam, but rest every day. Find some time to, you know, do something you enjoy, like go for a walk, read a book or exercise. Um, because part three is, is a lot of new information. So kind of looking after yourself. Um, I found that really helped me throughout this you know, difficult time um, to make sure that you're rested because the rested brain kind of performs better. Um, so hopefully I didn't waffle too much and too quickly uh, through this whole thing. And if you have any further questions, uh, drop them in the Q&A and um, hopefully I'll be able to answer them. So yes, yeah, so now back to you, Natalie. <laughs> Great, thank you, Gabby. Our next speaker is Albina Atanasova, an associate at Scott Rig Brown, Scott Brown Rig, sorry, and former student rep on RIBA National Council. We welcome Albina. Thank you, Natalie, and um, thank you, Gabby. It was great to hear about you. I definitely don't miss the PDRs, I must admit, but I still have the Architects um, Pocket Handbook with my tabs on. Um, so I thought I'd start with a little bit about my journey and my experience. So as Natalie mentioned, um, I'm an associate architect at Scott Brownrigg, but I actually work in design delivery unit, which is a um, sister company. So what does that mean? I am ex essentially an executive architect. So I work mainly on RBA stages three to seven. And the easiest way to describe it is 
I help great visions become a living reality. I quite like that. Um, I finished my part one in 2011 um, and why I'm boring you with this detail because in 2011 when I finished it was hard to find work, um, pay was low, you were competing for jobs with people that were made redundant and had a lot more experience. Um, I needed six months of experience to get back to do my part two. Um, and when I actually found work, um, everything was going great for a couple of months and then the company went under. So there was a lot of uncertainty, there was a lot of stress, um, but also looking back now, that was um, a great opportunity. And I, and I want to stress that you should never miss opportunities and crisis situations. So my opportunity was to um, work for a company called Oxford International Education Group, which is a travel agent. Um, I worked as a centre manager, which was basically um, looking after um, booking coaches. Um, I was looking after 12 to 18 year old students um, on a summer campus in the UK. I had to, um, to deal with about 50 different members of staff. Um, so I actually learned a lot about management very early on. Um, I learned a great deal of how to use Excel, which is actually very helpful in my current role. Um, but I also mainly learned about um, dealing with people, um, unhappy students, unhappy parents, um, happy and in tears when they're leaving the UK um, and want to come back. So um, people skills was, was a great um, kind of learning curve for me. Um, I then went on to do my part two in uh, Manchester and finished my part three in the Bartlett in 2016. And um, I was made an associate in 2019. So all in all, in, in a nutshell, um, it took about eight years to qualify. I moved a lot. I lived in nine different postcodes and four different cities. Um, and I had some good and bad experiences, but I also had a lot of support. And really all of that helped me get to where I am today and shape who I am. So I thought for my bit, I would just share some of the things that I learned post part three um, that I thought were very helpful and helped me get to where I am today. Um, so the first one is uh, about being proactive and being involved. And um, when I was in Manchester, I got the opportunity to sit on RBA Council. Um, that, that then opened up the opportunity for RBA National Council. I then became the first vice president for students and associates. I then got involved with the education committee, so I got to, to sit on validation boards for schools of architecture. Um, that then led back to um, our company being involved in setting up apprenticeships, so I was part of the apprenticeship team. I'm now a mentor for part three students and apprentices, so really it's, it's a point about one opportunity led to another um, and to open new doors and new experiences for me. Um, the next point is really about um, people because we all work with people and people like to work with people they like and they get along with. So to be likable, you need to communicate. And that means not just writing emails, it means picking up the phone. It means being interested in the people that you work with, what makes them tick. Um, you know, we all have bad days and we all have good days and um, we all spend a hell of a lot of time together. And if we don't get along, we don't end up making great architecture. Um, always have an opinion um, because everyone else does um, and architecture is opinionated and you shouldn't be ashamed um, to share that. Um, you should also listen more. Don't just think you know best. Um, that's a key skill I'm, I'm still learning. Um, have a checklist. Um, they're very useful for architecture but many other things in life. Um, it's also very satisfying for me to know that I've achieved something small, be it every day or every week. It helps me keep focused in the long term goals that I set myself. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, the, the learning doesn't stop with part three. And also don't be afraid to ask for help when you need it. I definitely wouldn't be in the position I am today without the support of my colleagues, of the mentors I had. Um, I really have to give a good Big shout out to Scott Brownick for taking me on this journey and giving me the opportunities. Um, be patient is the other thing because um, we all know the architectural journey is long. I mean, whether it should be longer or shorter is another matter. Um, but also projects take long. You know, it could be three, four years before you actually see your design being completed. And the last bit to finish on really is just be proud of what you do, whether you end up 
staying in architecture, going elsewhere in the construction industry. Um, there's a lot of opportunities and you need to own your own um, experiences and career. You know, it's difficult, it's stressful. We've all been there, but enjoy the ride because it's also very rewarding. Thank you very much. Back to you, Natalie. That's great. Thanks, Alvina. And now we're going over to Mitch Stefrans, who is Membership Development Manager at the RIBA. Welcome, Mitch. Hi, everyone. My name's Mitch. Um, I uh, work at the RIBA and my job basically is to help anyone who wants to become an RIBA member find out how to join um, and guide you through that process, really. And that's anyone anywhere in the world and any stage you're at. So if you're a student or if you're a fully qualified architect or setting up your own practice, um, my team are around to help. Um, I speak to so many people who are joining and they've all got different really good reasons for joining. Um, everything from um, wanting an architectural network, wanting access to loads of resources online, access to events and inspirational speakers, um, just kind of inspiration generally from the content that we put out at the RIBA um, and learning and just architectural news staying on top of, of what's going on. Um, so those are kind of the broad themes. I've got five minutes, so I won't go into detail about all of it, but I did want to just show you um, a bit of an overview of the membership categories um, and some of the benefits that you might not be aware of. Um, so I will share my screen and just show you. Oops, sorry, it's not worked, has it? There we go. Hopefully that's worked now. Um, any questions you have about RIBA membership, you can find on the join pages of architecture.com. Um, if you search join RIBA, it'll show you exactly um, where it is. Um, in order of where you are, student membership is open to anyone on a REBA part one or two course. Um, most of you are probably through that now, which means you should be eligible for RIBA associate membership, which is um, open for anyone who's completed their parts one or two or have an equivalent qualification. Um, I'm aware not all of you are from the UK or the EU. Um, if you are doing your part three and you don't have your part one or two, um, you can join as an affiliate member, which gives you a lot of the same benefits, um, but doesn't have the same requirements. So that's usually what we suggest for anyone who's um, done a different path, but still doing their part three. Um, once you finish your part three, you are eligible for chartered membership. So some of you um, might be almost there. Some of you might have um, a year or two left, um, but um, that's kind of the ultimate aim. And then beyond that, possibly fellow membership or becoming um, setting up your own RIBA chartered practice. Um, I've gone through some of the benefits with you, but I just wanted to show you some of the new ones. Um, RIB Academy, which we just launched um, earlier this year, which is basically putting CPD and RIBA learning all onto an online platform, um, which is really good timing as we go more and more, um, especially now onto everything being online. Um, basically just huge amounts of resources available. RIBA members get 50% off any of the paid for content, but also get access to some free content as well. So really good um, for your learning, no matter what stage you're at. Um, and that's really, really good to know about. Um, just wanted to show you the membership um, kind of um, dashboard as well. So basically, as soon as you become a member, you've got access to this. Make sure you log in once a month. It'll have all your news on there um, and access to all of your resources. Um, associate members, affiliate members and chartered members get um, a subscription to the Reba Journal, um, which is a really great way again of just staying inspired, staying current. Um, but people don't know that you actually get um, a full subscription to the Reba um, digital backlog as well, um, which I've logged into here. Huge amounts of resource on here. So as you're going through, again, any stage of your career, really, really um, useful thing to have. Um, for associate members, uh, membership starts at £67 and goes up to £261, um, depending on when you completed your part two or qualified. 
Um, for the first few years of chartered membership, the fee is £237, and that's actually just gone down a bit from last year. Um, just um, understanding that a lot of people right now are, um, don't have as much money as they used to um, and might be struggling a bit. Um, affiliate membership is £140 a year and student membership is free. So if you are in that category, do join. Um, all the information is on these join pages. Um, you can go on here, you can find the pricing, you can find the eligibility, you can get a bullet point of every single um, benefit and you can download an application form um, as well or just make an inquiry which goes to my team. So um, I or one of my team will um, write back to you. Um, please ask any questions you've got about eligibility or membership either in this forum or just make an inquiry, send us an email. Um, but before I go, just wanted to also share from one of my colleagues um, a slide which is basically about the RIBA um, part three course. Um, if you're already enrolled, ignore this, but basically if you, if you are looking at what part three course to choose, please know that the RIBA do one um, in the UK, uh, but also internationally. I think we've got a few people from outside of the UK joining. Um, we've been running courses now for a while in Hong Kong, UAE and um, China recently as well. Um, so uh, take a quick screen grab if you want of these details. Um, my colleagues can help um, provide more information. Um, and uh, we can put some information on the links um, in the chat here as well. Um, so that's been a really, really quick run through five minutes, but hopefully a good snapshot of what our IBA membership is about. Um, ask away, send us emails. We want everyone to join um, and, and, and be part of this wonderful architectural community. Thanks very much. That's great. Thank you, Mitch. Now let's hear from Stephen Brookhouse, author of the Part 3 Handbook. So this guy quite literally wrote the book on Part 3. Um, Stephen is an experienced practitioner and professional studies advisor. So welcome, Stephen. OK, thank you and uh, welcome everybody. And thanks for that introduction that, um, yeah, I've been doing Part 3 for a while now, um, but it only feels like yesterday, as we say. I should just say, uh, just following on from what, what Midge said in true BBC uh, fashion, other courses are available. Um, just, uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to plug my own, of course. Okay, I, getting back to the, um, the the main topic here, I've been asked to give you some reflections on COVID and the challenges for part three. And the first thing I want to say is that part three course teams are, are very clear about the need to support the career development of uh, talented, creative young professionals who've already dedicated six or more years of their adult lives and probably more um, to architecture. So, uh, and it's a point I make to anybody who will listen, um, particularly at, um, at institutions such as the ARB um, and, and any examining body as well. COVID has been an unprecedented shock to the industry. But unlike the financial crisis of 2008, and Albina has sort of reflected on the tail end of that, which ran on till 2012, 2015 in some places, um, the underlying economy was relatively robust. Uh, John may, you know, may comment on that later. Uh, robust until March. And, and Brexit, whatever that is, um, was our main worry, in fact. Um, the RIBA September um, 2020 workloads um, survey gives a really mixed picture. You know, 31% of practices expect growth, 47 are about the same, um, and, and the rest are really seeing a reduction. And I've been talking to part three students around the country and doing, doing interviews really since April. And practices are being supportive um, where they can. Um, in fact, I was talking to a student in Leeds last week where they are specialising in retail, which has really been heavily hit, um, where they're actually recruiting for, for members of staff. And he was saying that his senior partner just could never have anticipated that in, in March. So what are the expectations, the reality of doing part three at the moment? Well, those students who are in employment on part three have had their projects disrupted, as we've sort of heard already. And working online and at home is challenging. Part two students are finding it difficult to get a job. 
but I would urge you not to put your career on hold. Be prepared to be more flexible when it comes to experience. Consider fields, other fields in the construction industry. Um, students gain valuable insights working for clients, contractors and specialist um, subcontractors. And for part three, 20 hours a week is classed as sufficient to meet the practical training requirements, giving you, of course, lots of time to complete those PDR sheets. So consider working part time, be flexible and consider temporary work and maybe doing two jobs as well, not, not necessarily in two architectural practices, but something in practice or related areas um, and, and somewhere else, you know, be creative and stay in touch with friends, colleagues, offices, former employers and network, network where possible to support each other and also to learn from each other. Maybe consider social enterprise, helping charities, NGOs or housing associations. Also consider overseas work, um, even if that means from working remotely and you'd be in a good position to move should you wish to when borders open. I was talking to somebody in Hong Kong yesterday and, and they've broadly been working as normal. Um, uh, he was talking about the V spike in um, or the V curve in China, where effectively they've they've returned to, to normal. Um, so. Um, what might be your expectations? Well, there's no magic bullet. We're in this for a while, um, but life's got to go on. And I always advise students to start part three if they can. Don't delay it because you don't have a case study project. Um, even if you don't have a job, you know, you can take the lecture series, learn and take the exams. And it's always a good point to, to make an interview, to give some sort of narrative that you're on your way. Um, but don't go to an interview saying you need a part three case study project. That's just in a sense putting an obstacle in the way. Follow those three golden rules of architecture, which is get the job, get the job and get the job. And then when you're a bit more settled, think about the opportunities that are available. Stage five manufacturing construction is always going to be a challenge. So part three may take 18 months rather than 12. How would you get your best from your mentors, which is another question I've been asked to look at? Well, ironically, I think remote working um, may uh, may make it easier. So get feedback, discuss challenges and um, but don't be too demanding. And advice for the future will stay motivated. Being up on a part three course helps. You'll see progress with the study group. You'll give mutual support. Take the opportunities to improve your professional knowledge and look at the latest publications. Keep current. There's a lot happening post Grenfell and the professions responding to climate change, um, fire safety, sustainability. And attending free events, short courses, guerrilla tactics. I would give a plug for that, having contributed two years running. Um, a really valuable platform. Um, they'll make you more attractive to employers. You'll be able to talk at interviews about current issues and it helps future proof your career. So lastly, use your network to explore, um, maybe even consider shadowing, it's an option. Use your office as a resort and think differently in these challenging times. Thank you. That's great, thank you, Stephen. And now I'm pleased to welcome John Asale, Chairman and Co-Founder of Asale Architecture. He was appointed Fellow of the RIBA in 2019 for his contribution to the profession. Alongside hiring and mentoring architectural students at a sale, John helps students nationwide as an external, external examiner for part three at the Bartlett and London Metropolitan University. He's also lectured at Oxford Brookes, Sheffield, Lincoln, Huddersfield, London Metropolitan, Westminster and the Bartlett Universities. We welcome John. Well, thank you very much, Natalie, for that introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm the last speaker, so um, that's quite cool because I can draw on some of the things the other people have said. Um, first bit of advice I want to give you, buy Stephen Brookhouse's book. It's the, it is the book that's going to guide you all through this course. Uh, I make sure that all the students in my office get hold of a copy and somebody, I think Alice has asked a question, Alice Adams, about what to do at the interview. In that book, it even talks about how you should perform at the interview, so please buy it. I've lectured to thousands of part three students uh, over the time. I've been a mentor 
to over 100. So I, I know what you're all going to be going through. Three of my students passed uh, a couple of weeks ago and I've got seven at the moment doing their part, just started their part three at Westminster. So my little brief chat today, I'm going to talk about a number of things. First, I'm going to give you some stats about the profession and make you feel good. Secondly, I'm going to uh, just explain to you what you should expect in your journey for part three. Thirdly, what we do in our practice, so you can hear my own view of that. And then finally, a few tips on the course. So here's some stats. So 4,500 students started part one, but only 3,100 made it. At part two, 2,200 started and only 2,000 made it. So for you guys that have got part two, you're quite rare. And those of you who are going to pass at part three, only 1,500 a year make it. So the numbers are tiny and I want you to realise how special you are because our profession is very small. We have 43,000 ARB architects, they're registered architects, and we have about 23,000 that are chartered architects in the UK. Let's compare that to surveyors, 125,000 surveyors. There are 135,000 solicitors, 235,000 doctors, and guess what, a third of a million accountants. So you guys that make it finally at part three to become a registered architect, you really are very special. So what do you expect to get out of your part three? Well, there are a few requirements and uh, Stephen's mentioned the mentor. You must get a supportive mentor. Uh, and I would urge that you try and get somebody quite senior that's been around a bit, that's been through a few recessions and dealt with builders that have gone bust and all those other things, rather than somebody that's only been qualified for a year or two. You need to expect a good salary. The RIBA rules are quite strict. You're not allowed to be an internee, to do an internship and do PEDRs. You're supposed to be paid the living wage. And by the way, that's only 18,000 a year, which is shockingly low for somebody doing part three. You are also expected to be given 10 days additional study leave by your practice. I know many firms of architects that don't do this. If they're chartered practices, then they are obliged to do it. It's in the rules, so point it out to them. Some good firms will pay their fees too, or a proportion of the fees for part three, which is very generous of them. Um, but as a part three uh, student, you've got to realise that you don't know very much. You reciprocate by being loyal uh, and with hard work. And do be aware of the issues like confidentiality, because at part three, some firms will share with you how they're running the practice. Please don't go and bleat all that information to your colleagues. This is confidential information, so you should keep it between you and your practice. So what do we do in our firm? Well, we have loads of students. I have 25 students at the moment at various levels um, and I'm their mentor. So the chairman in my practice is me and I mentor all the students. And what does that mean? Well, it means that they come and moan to me a lot about not having the right experience. Um, but I also give them a two hour seminar every two weeks. And we go through all sorts of things that you uh, will get to grips with at part three. What's the difference between a schedule of condition and a schedule of dilapidations? All that sort of stuff that you need to know, guys. We also give them good salaries. So those starting part three are on a minimum of 30,000 a year, plus bonuses and pri private medical cover and all those other things. Yes, we do pay the fees, but they have to work for us for a year afterwards. Otherwise, they've got to pay it back. So it's the least I think we can expect from them. Do they get appropriate experience? Well, most of the time they do, um, but not all the time. And PDRs, please do the PDRs. You can imagine if I've got 25 students and the PDRs are 10 pages long, that's 250 pages every quarter I have to check and I hate them being out of date, so please do it. What happens in my firm when you qualify, when you get a 12 hour lunch, um, I'm invited, I, if I pay, um, they get an immediate pay rise. So we don't wait for the ARB uh, certificate to come through and they get uh, new business cards immediately so they can show off and say that they are architects. So this course you're thinking of joining at the RIBA is the fastest growing part three in the country. There are lots of other good ones that uh, Stephen mentioned and I'm an examiner and I lecture at most of them. In terms of the requirements of the course, um, you've heard it said before, PDRs, please keep those up to date, very important. The case study does not have to be 
a traditional contract from start to finish, so relax about that. The examination is a problem. You need to have a bit of practice at that just to get the handwriting done, or if you're lucky enough to have on computer, great. And the professional interview, um, yes, you need to be prepared for that. Um, please do a rehearsal. Um, I interview lots of students, and uh, every year I fail students who have passed all the exams, passed the case study, the career appraisal, fabulous CV, they come along to the interview and they fail. I've had people crying, I've had people once have nervous breakdowns, it's all very awkward and difficult. So remember, the interview is part of the examination process and you have to be prepared for it. And finally, it's going to be fine, guys, because although it takes a long time to qualify, in most people it's nine and a half years, it's a very special profession you're joining. Zaha's first building wasn't done until she was 48. It's OK. Be patient. You're going to make it. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, John. Yeah, so we're leaving on a positive there. <laughs> OK, so thank you to all of our speakers. Um, we've covered a lot of ground in the last few minutes. So just before we move on to questions, we have a few announcements. There are some upcoming events that I'd like to share with you. October is Black History Month and you can join RIBA and Paradigm Network for a Black History Month boot club event on the 29th of October. Guerrilla Tactics is RIBA's annual creative business conference for small and medium sized architectural practices. It's taking place this year between the 9th and 13th of November and it's curated by creative director Thomas and Miller of Miller and Howard Workshop. The programme is a mixture of CPD session and a conference exploring how to reinvent practice. So it's definitely worth attending if you're considering setting up on your own, a practitioner looking for inspiration or a student interested in deeper insights into the world of practice. There's also Future Architects Discuss, studying mental health in partnership with the Architects Benevolent Society on the 11th of November. So let's move on to some questions from the audience. Um, and you're going to have to bear with me for a little while. I have a look through them. So. Having a quick look through, I think we have covered a lot of ground and everything that, that that we've said, but I'm sure that we can, you know, pull out a few more things from that. Um, OK, so. Well, this is this is kind of a, an urgent one, I guess, um, and I'm sure we'll be able to pull out a little bit more from it. But um, the question is, I'm about to and I'll probably aim this one at Stephen since uh, since you did write the book <laughs> and I'm sure there's useful hints and tips in that. Um, so. I'm about to have my part three interview next week. Can you give me some last minute hints and tips? Wow. Uh, wow, that's uh, that's um, actually and I, I, I sort of following on from John's thing is um, his preparation. Um, I I was amazed how, uh, you know, the icebreaker question is very often. Uh, yeah, and have you had a chance to look through your, um, you know, your submission and maybe had a look at the exam questions again? And and that's intended to sort of put you on um, a more relaxed footing. And you'd be amazed how many people say, well, well, no, I haven't actually. Um, and that's <laughs> that that doesn't look good. Um, it isn't, and you know, it's not a tall story. This it does happen. So yeah, be you know, be prepared. Work through your material. I'm actually a great believer for those of you who've heard me talk about written examinations in sort of playing the thing through. You know, thinking about what what might happen, the questions that might come up, um, how you'd sort of answer them. Um, very good to talk to your study group. Um, I often wonder, especially as as written examination, oh, sorry, as, as oral exams are being staggered at the moment, whether people in their study groups sort of say, do you know what? I was asked about this, I was asked about that. Um, anecdotal evidence, as you'll find in, if you look at the book, is 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 pretty dangerous. Um, so, you know, just stay focused, keep to your own patch, um, review your material. Uh, and, and, and as John said, you know, stay calm. Um, be professional. Please don't burst into tears. I did have somebody a, a month or so ago who, you know, it was a simple question. I was trying to help them. They just said, I just don't know. Uh, and, and it was very difficult to, to go anywhere with that question. You know, maybe come back and say, could you explore that? A little? Can we explore that a bit more? OK, great. Um, the second question I'll ask Albina to answer. 
And the question is, it's got kind of two parts to it. As a part two MARC graduate, it's been challenging to find a part two architectural assistant job right now with limited vacancies in the UK. Do you have any advice? Um, and do you think this will impact the journey towards part three, having a gap in the CV? So that's the full question. Hello, thank you for the question. Um, very similar to kind of my experience, I don't think it will impact um, having a gap in your CV. I think you should use it as an opportunity to fill that gap that um, with other experiences. Um, I don't know whether you're applying just to architectural practices, but obviously being part of the construction industry, you have the benefit of um, looking for experience with contractors and developers, um, even different aspects and in different industries as well. And I think it's about trying to keep learning new things, um, find ways to implement the things that you learn, because sometimes I think um, it may not be straightforward how something you learn may be applicable to your architectural career, um, but actually it, it can be and it can be very helpful. Um, and I think it, it is difficult. I, I've been there as well. Um, but you shouldn't give up. You should stay positive and, and also take advantage of all the online platforms and connectivity. I mean, LinkedIn is a great tool. You can connect with so many people. You can um, search for jobs. Um, the more forums and things you participate with, sometimes it's just by a matter of conversation that someone may have not posted the job advert, but actually likes you and offers you a bit of experience um, that can take you on to taking on a permanent role. So you never really, you just need to be open. You don't know where these, these things may come from. Um, that would be my advice. Great, thank you, Albina. Um, the next question I'm going to ask John to answer for me, um, and this one's about case studies. So the question is, how do you look at the later stages of experience in the case study, especially site-based experience? Um, given we're in a context now where a lot of projects have been delayed and it's very difficult to get on-site experience. Um, is there a minimal amount of experience that you think would be acceptable for those later stages in the project um, to be documented as part of the case study? And I guess as well in the PDR forms. Well, thanks, Natalie. Yes, this is a challenge for both students and also for practices. Um, you know, I've got seven students at the moment, all started part three and all want to have a, a decent case study. Um, the thing to do is to be relaxed about it. We don't need to have uh, you seeing a project through using a traditional contract, through planning, uh, tendering and on site. What's important about the case study is for it to be rather more than a chronological list of what's happened um, to being um, a series of reflections. So what we want as examiners, and I think Stephen will support me here, is not just I did this and she did that and then we got planning and I mean, in a way, who cares? What we want to know about is when there were problems and on reflection, how do you think that should have been dealt with? Now, with our staff, most of them do two projects for their case studies. Often they've been involved in a planning application, so that's, that's uh, uh, what they focus on. And then uh, on site, often they shadow uh, a project on the site. Um, clearly part three students don't know too much about, you know, stages five and six uh, or even stages four. Um, and so often they are not there um, producing the, um, the detailed information, but we do get them to shadow and it's OK to shadow a job. OK, you don't have to feel that you have to be there at every site meeting dealing with all those issues. You have to have a decent mentor that's going to take you to site and show you the issues and explain how lessons could have been learned uh, from things that have gone wrong. So this a whole idea about having one project. Forget about that. It's about maybe two projects and having a series of, of reflections on your views on what went wrong and what could be learned from that for the future. Thanks, Natalie. That's great. Thank you, John. So the next question I'm going to ask to Gabby because you've recently um, completed part three. So the question is, how do you know when it's the right time to start your part three studies? Or at least how did you did you know that that it was the right time for you? That's a really good question. Um, and to be honest with you, um, I finished my uh, part two a year ago, uh, well, a year and a half ago. 
and I didn't feel like I was ready yet. And if there are any perfectionists out there, sometimes you feel like I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. Um, I don't know this. I don't know that. Um, and you might feel like that. I think taking part three because there is so much uh, that you kind of expected to know. Um, I was encouraged by um, my boss in the office. Uh, we had a really successful project and he just asked me, do you think, um, are you thinking about taking part three? And I was like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm ready yet. And he was like, yes, I think you are, uh, go for it. And so I started preparing. So I think it's really different um, for everyone. Obviously you need to have the minimum 24 months of experience, um, but you really kind of grow with the part three course as well. And I think I felt like the amount um, I learned, the new information, you just soak it, up, uh, soak it in as a sponge. Um, and it's really up to you. If you put your mind to it, um, you really can push yourself and um, prepare. And um, so I think if you're here, uh, you've done your part two, um, go for it. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Gabby. Um, the next one's another one for John. Um, and the person who's asked the question is specifically asked for John. So they've asked, do you have any advice on how to make the best use of your mentor's time during part three discussions? And what are the main things we're encouraged to discuss? So, well, what I guess whilst you're um, undertaking your part three. Uh, thanks, Natalie. Um, well, I hope that most of you are lucky enough to get a mentor that's going to be very straightforward and honest with you uh, and give you time, um, because often you don't need that much time to uh, address certain issues. Um, but for me, uh, the main role of the mentor is to make sure that the student is being cared for and looked after during this whole process. Those of you just embarking on part three uh, don't really understand what an awful journey it really is. Um, it's a long and painful journey. And when you think when you got part two, hey, it's cool, I'm, I've only got part three to do. It's a whole different thing. And the mentor's role is to support and cajole uh, the mentees. Now with me, I've got quite a lot of candidates who've been dyslexic. So uh, for me in my practice, dyslexia is a qualification. We like dyslexic people. So when I see that on the CV, I go, yes. Um, but it does mean that when we get to case studies and stuff, you know, it's a bit of a challenge, both organisationally and in, uh, frankly, grammar and spelling. So with me, I go through all of that in quite a lot of detail. Um, if you're dyslexic, you need a mentor that's going to help you with that stuff. The main area, though, that a mentor, if they're experienced, can help you with is how to run a practice. Now, uh, I know as a, 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 I'm an examiner, I see all sorts of stuff from students where clearly they've not had a decent mentor to explain how practices are run. And I have other students who've been given all sorts of detailed information about the firm, the fees, the issues, all of that stuff. So if you have a good mentor, you should be able to interrogate that mentor to get all that detailed stuff out. How to run a firm? Why is it better to be a, a company and not a partnership? Tell me about invoicing. What is cash flow, for instance? And unless you've got a mentor that's experienced, you won't get any of that. So you'll just be reading from the books. And when you come to the exam or the interview, you'll be a bit at sea on that. So I would urge you to try and find a mentor that's going to be kind enough to share this confidential information with you. Because unless you know it part three, you're never going to know. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, John. Um, this question I'm going to ask to Stephen, and I don't even know the answer to this one, to be honest, but um, I'm just going to explain the situation. There's somebody who has started their part three studies, but has been on furlough for three months. So that time that they've been furloughed, they haven't been in practice. So does that three month of furlough period that would have contributed to the 24 months of experience still count? Or do they need to do an additional three months experience on top of that to fill in that time? OK, that's a really interesting question. And so I'm racking my brains as to what the accurate answer is, bearing in mind that this is being recorded. Um, I think, strictly speaking, you know, if you're on furlough, you're not not employed in, in uh, full time architectural practice. Um, um, and I would um, therefore um, extract from that that it wouldn't be time that you could uh, record 
as working in practice. However, there, you know, if you can maintain some other activity, then that might be eligible. Um, I don't think we can be definitive about that, but I think strictly speaking, if you're not working, you're not working. Um, there are other things you can do. Um, and we would we would face this situation when uh, in the financial crisis where we, um, you know, Westminster, we effectively created a workshop where people could work 20 hours a week um, on their case studies and on on a virtual case study, in fact. But that was an exception. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm afraid, you know, um, finish on a bit of a downer here and say I suspect that's not uh, um, that's not going to be um, eligible for the PER requirements in terms of practical training. What I would also add, though, you know, if you're worried about three months one way or the other, then then that's raising a few other warning bells from me about, you know, are you, uh, is it so finely tuned that this three months is going to be absolutely essential for, for your part three? I'm, I'm worried that perhaps you're not going to be prepared anyway. And as John said a little bit earlier, you know, just spool back a little bit and, and relax, you know, um, make the most of that time um, and, and and get it into your head that maybe it's going to be six months now. Um, it wasn't going to be that that date that you thought it was going to be. Stuff happens. Um, and I could say, well, at least you're on furlough, you know, um, but that sounds a bit dismissive. I don't mean it that way, but I'm trying to think about that positively. You know, the, you will be getting back. There will be experience that will count and you'll just have to take a deep breath and, the, you know, maybe you're going to be doing your um, examination because it's it's the 24 months as a qualification to take the oral examination. Um, you may be doing that a little bit later. That's great, thank you. Yeah, and a really interesting question, that one, very timely. Um, the next one I'm going to ask is to Mitch, um, and this is quite specifically about the RIBA. Um, so how do RIBA ensure that membership is proportionally representative and accessible to all? Brilliant, that's a really good question. Um, I won't be able to give it a very, very full answer, but I guess there are two things. So in terms of it being representative, um, how do we ensure that is, I think, um, a massive question. It's not right now. Um, and I think um, it's, it's one of the barriers that I get quite often speaking to people trying to get them to join. They say, I don't want to join. I don't feel represented. Um, and one of the things I do say at that point is going, I know, but if, if you join, you can help make it rep representative. So we do need people to join so that it can be representative. But I, I think there are a lot of issues that the RIPA um, kind of acknowledges um, that it could do better in terms of um, diversity um, and representation. There's a lot of work going on right now um, around trying to a, get better information so that we understand from our membership, are we representative? So a, a large piece around data, but then just a lot of programming that we need to do as well around making sure that our membership and the profession um, is diverse. So I, I hope that answers that question as well as I can. Um, second one about accessibility. I'm, I'm guessing this is mostly around cost. Um, so student membership is free, um, so that's very accessible. Please join if you're a student member. Um, Chartered membership, um, so, so you do get a slight discount of £237 a year for the first six years. I know that is still quite a lot of money for a lot of people, um, but um, we do also offer a reduced rate. So anyone earning under £20,000 can get a reduced rate um, of £80 a year. Um, so that's some ways that we can make it kind of slightly more affordable. Associate membership, I think, is a tricky one because it does get quite expensive the longer you go on and so at the end of it you're actually paying slightly more than a recently qualified chartered member that's something that i think we need to address um but um sorry it's quite a quite a broad broad answer but quite a broad question so hopefully just enough any more questions just, just let us know afterwards as well that's great thank you um so i think this might be the last question. We might have time for two more, I'm not sure. But um, so I guess I'll aim this one at John again. Um, although it might it might be too um, it might be kind of too current to be able to answer, but at least we can I suppose speculate around it. Um, are there any changes in the process of examination itself in this new working from home situation? 
um, or could you anticipate that? Um, and how long do you think they'll be sustained? This person's planning to take an exam in March 2021 um, and they're expecting that it might end up being virtual. Uh, yes, uh, Natalie, I, I think that we're all challenged at the moment about how to deal with exams. Um, I've recently uh, been doing um, interviews at the Bartlett uh, for part three uh, on Teams. Um, and the difficulty with that is that you don't really get to feel the body language and you don't get to see how confident the candidates are. So although we we did make it work um, and actually this year I passed everybody, um, it was it was difficult to examine people at the end of this long process. And for most people, as I said earlier, it's nine and a half years. The final gateway is the interview. And for me, doing it on Teams is not the way to do it. I, I was uncomfortable um, uh, about that process. So I hope that when we come out of all this, uh, whilst we might have exams that are dealt with remotely, in terms of the oral, I think you should sit in front of the two examiners uh, and explain yourself uh, to make sure that your final gateway to be allowed into the profession um, is done physically, not, not remotely. Does that answer it, do you think, Natalie? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so I think this is the, the final question and I'm going to ask this to Albina. Um, what do you think would be the best way of preparing for the written exam when you don't have a study group and potentially kind of a relationship with a mentor there? Um, do you think there's anything else online that might be that people might be able to kind of get into or, or look into to help them um, for additional support? Thank you, Natalie. Um, well, it's a tough one. Um, I would say, I mean, study groups in part of your part three course cohort are useful, but study groups are also um, talking to peers, talking to colleagues, talking to other friends. I mean, most architecture courses, um, you end up going through, um, you know, hundreds of people. Um, I actually had a study group that was within my part three course, but I also had a separate kind of study group, which was just friends that I did part two or part one with. We were actually doing all different courses. Um, and that was helpful in a way of um, kind of sharing some of the, the knowledge and the questions, especially when preparing for the written exams. Um, in terms of the mentor, um, I think, yes, a practice mentor is helpful, but that doesn't mean that you can't have mentors elsewhere that could equally help you and give you support and advice. And sometimes I think, um, well, at least with my mentor, it's more about just encouragement and um, making sure that you're OK, that you're not stressing. Um, and, and these are things that I think any mentor within the, the profession or outside the profession can help with. Um, there's loads of um, online mentoring that you can sign up to. Um, the RBA offers some. Um, there's other forums within the industry that you could um, look up for a mentor. So don't don't take it as it's not working with this one. Um, therefore, doom and gloom, don't know what to do. I think there's also always opportunities um, and, and do look up people and and call the RIBA, um, speak to your university. They can help as well. There's loads of people out there that can help you and support you. It's just about asking and don't be afraid to ask. That's great, Alvina. Thank you. OK, so we're coming to the end of our meetup tonight, so I'll have to draw the event to a close now. And um, thank you to all of our speakers for your insights and your encouragement. And um, thank you to all of you who have attended the meetup this evening. We hope it's been useful and it's provided you with the inspiration to turn a challenge, which is even more of a challenge this year, let's admit, into an opportunity. Um, You'll receive a post event feedback form, so please take a couple of minutes to complete this so we can continue to develop the Future Architects programme. And remember to sign up as an RIBA member to stay in touch as part of this network. So thank you again, stay safe, seek opportunities, and above all, try to stay on track in these difficult times to achieve your goals. So good night, thank you.